favourite parables then? Don't just if you've got a favourite parable, call it out. You don't have to say why. I'm not going to ask. So, what? Why is it so important to you? But favourite parables. The good Samaritan. The good Samaritan. Lovely. The sower. The sower. The sower. Yep. The sower. The sower. Any others? The labourers in the market place who were called at different times of the day. Indeed, the labourers in the market place who all got the same wage at the end of the day. Nice. I remember that in Sunday school and I would go, but it's not fair! <laughs> Any others? The, the ten wise virgins. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any others? The lost coin, yeah. The lost son. The lost, the lost sheep. The lost sheep. <laughs> Lots of lostness. Well, that's quite a spread, isn't it? I am actually going to talk about the lost son today. The um, parables, as I said at the beginning can leave us in a place of disquiet, can't they? Because they don't have closure. They have an ending. They don't have closure in the sense of it's not all nicely mapped out for us. And there's only one example of a parable, actually, that Jesus um, does explain, and that is the sower. He doesn't explain the others. He leaves it for people to work out for themselves. The lost son... The, th the third, actually, of three lost and found stories. And I'm going to read The Lost Son. It'll be on the screen in um, NIV, but I'm going to read it in The Passion uh, because it just there's a slightly different um, language to it because it's a story that we know so well. Uh, I'm going to read the whole story, so um, bear with me. Luke 15. Then Jesus said... Once there was a father with two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me my share of your estate? So the father went ahead and distributed between the two sons their inheritance. Shortly afterward, the younger son packed up all his belongings and travelled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far-off land, where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. With everything spent and nothing left, talk about saying it twice, everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry because there was a severe famine in that land. So he begged a farmer in that country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. The son was so famished, he was willing even to eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated, the son finally realized what he was doing and he thought, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? I want to go back to my father's house and I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I'll never again be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young son set off for home. From a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar. And great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. The father raced out to meet him, swept him up in his arms, hugged him dearly, and kissed him over and over with tender love. Then the, the son said, Father, I was wrong. I've sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. The father interrupted and said, Son, you're home now. Turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe. 
and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. And bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For my beloved son was once dead, but now he's alive. Once he was lost, but now he is found. And everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Now the older son was out working in the field when the, his brother returned. And as he approached the house, he heard the music of celebration and dancing. He called over one of the servants and asked, what's going on? The servant replied, it's your younger brother. He's returned home. I wonder what tone that was. It's your younger brother. <laughs> Don't know. He's returned home. And your father is throwing a party to celebrate his homecoming. Might have been. It's your younger brother. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. 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 Don't know. Sorry. The older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him, come and enjoy the feast with us. The son said, father, listen, how many years have I worked like a slave for you? performing every duty you've asked as a faithful son, and I've never once disobeyed you. But you've never thrown a party for me because of my faithfulness. Never once have you ever given me a goat that I could feast on and celebrate with my friends as this son of yours is doing now. Look at him. He comes back after wasting your wealth on prostitutes and reckless living. And here you are throwing a great feast to celebrate for him. The father said, my son, you are always with me by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to rejoice and celebrate like this because your brother was once dead and gone. But now he's alive and back with us again. He was lost, but now he is found. This parable, it's important to um, just think about the context of when Jesus told this and what he'd been speaking of beforehand. Because it's the third of three lost and found stories. And the stories are told to a mixed crowd. They're told to, um, in verse 1, tax collectors and sinners, Pharisees and teachers of the law. Everybody and somebody was there. A crowd, you might say, full of those who are lost, know they're lost, yearning to be found. And a crowd of people who think they are found and don't recognise that they're lost. Will they recognise anything for themselves in these stories? Or are they going to do what sometimes we're all guilty of and think... Well, I hope that one over there is listening to this because they really need to hear it. <laughs> These three stories have progression. Don't know if you've ever noticed the progression. The volume goes down. The value goes up. So in the first story, 100 sheep, one lost. In the next story, how many coins? Ten. One lost. In the lost son, one son, one lost. So you can see how the, the value of what is lost has increased. Increased all the way through. One son, one lost. So I wonder what this story is going to say to each one of us today. I've deliberately kept calling it, actually you called it, the lost son. How else do we know this? The prodigal son. The prodigal son. Yeah. If I'd read the NIV, would the prodigal, the word prodigal be in it? Maybe not. No, it isn't. It's the lost son. Yeah. So where does prodigal come from? Why do we call this story the prodigal son? 
Some of our Bibles might have it as a heading, but it's not in the story. I have to dig around a bit. But if I read Luke 15, halfway through the story, verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there prodigaled his wealth in wild living. He prodigaled his wealth in wild living. So what did he do? He wasted it. He squandered it. So to prodigal is to squander, to waste. So the younger son is associated with wasteful, extravagant living. And that's why he's kind of been given the title of the prodigal son. And we know, we know the story, we've read it. He ends up, um, he takes his inheritance, he actually asks for inheritance, which is as good as um, um, saying to his dad, I wish you were dead. In those terms, you know, I wish you weren't here because I want your money. And being the younger son, he would have had one third, the older son would have had two thirds. And um, he went, we know not where, but he wasted it all in extravagant living. And verse 17 didn't quite come out the same in the Passion Translation. Verse 17, he came to his senses. It's the turning point of the story, isn't it? He came to his senses. A little phrase, but what a transformative statement that is. He came to his senses. Literally, he finds himself emotionally, physically, perhaps spiritually. He realizes where he is, what he's doing, the stupidity of it, the wastefulness of it, the consequences of his actions. Maybe he's willing to take a little bit of responsibility. This is why I got here and how. Perhaps he only just now is beginning to understand his lostness. But of course he's squandered more than the money, hasn't he? He's squandered the love of his father. He's squandered his part in the family. He's squandered that sense of belonging. Even his identity perhaps has been squandered, wasted. He's squandered the belonging. And now he belongs nowhere. Does he have a place there anymore? Doesn't know, unless he goes back. So the lost son, the prodigal son, is the younger son, isn't he? Yeah. Is he? Let's have a look at the older son. The older son stayed at home. He was the good boy. Were you the good boy or the good girl in your family? He stayed at home. He stayed at home in the home and the land of his father. He worked for his father. And now it's going to be entirely his when his dad dies. Because that, actually the version I read said that the father divided his inheritance. It almost sounded like the son got his bit. The older son got his bit as the younger son got his. I don't know for sure. It was his place of belonging. Was he content? He distanced himself, didn't he, from the homecoming. He distanced himself from the younger brother. He begrudged the fatted calf. He begrudged the restoration to sonship. He too is a prodigal. It's just that he squandered different things. He squandered his family. He squandered all that he's got in terms of relationships. He squandered the meaning of home and belonging. He squandered the wealth of joy. That makes him a prodigal too, doesn't it? Bitter, disconnected relationships. Both sons then are prodigals. So when the story is called the prodigal son, which one's it referring to? When it's called the lost son, which of them are lost? Both. Both. They're both lost in different ways. 
I wonder if those who were listening in the crowd recognise their own lostness, their own prodigal natures, what they too have squandered. The righteous who were listening would have believed that they knew God. Perhaps the unrighteous were yearning for God. Would they recognise the father figure in the story? Is he a prodigal too? <laughs> Could you argue that the father figure in the story is a prodigal? Yes, you could. You could. Because he has squandered everything he had on a son that you could say didn't deserve it and wasted it. On the other son, <laughs> who wasn't terribly happy about what he'd got. He too could be a prodigal. Would we say that God is a prodigal? What word? Prodigal. That must be a long way back, Hilary, because everything I looked at said it was um, squandering and Spend reckless waste. In the sense of overspending. Oh, okay. 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 So we could say that God is, is prodigal then, because he has lavished his love and compassion on us, whether we want it, accept it, or not. It's there for us to, to take hold of, to, um, to step into. And it's generous not thinking of the consequences. Yeah, God yeah. gives it to us with, without knowing whether we will accept it. Yes, he starts. yes, yes. And that's, that's true of his compassion, his mercy, his grace. Some might say, well, what, how wasteful is that? Others might say, how generous is that? So what are we going to take from this story? Well, I'm not going to go there because um, Jesus would have left it at that point and that's for you to go away and ponder. For me, I think the key in the story, the, the words that really captured me was he came to his senses and suddenly he could see clearly, where perhaps he had not been able to see clearly now, uh, before. It's a story of healing. It's a story of great healing. But you need to find where that healing is for yourself, because it probably will be different for each one of us. Amen. <laughs>